One of my favorite quotes is small steps climb mountains. So you think about climbing Mount Everest, it's not something that you're gonna do in one night, but you're doing it in small steps. And if you stay on it and you're consistent, you stay the course, it will happen. But it just, you can't rush it. Anytime you rush it, it's not sustainable. You're playing around with the possibility of injuries a lot more than if you were taking your time. So I just, I like to remind people, go at your own pace. Don't compare, you know, my chapter 20 to your chapter two. I represent the average person if you stay consistent over a long period of time, if you don't stray from your diet and your, and your meals, if you stay in the gym and just keep working. Welcome to the Power Plant Body Podcast. My name is Taylor and this show is focused on self-development. I found in my own life, as well as the lives of my clients that I've worked with, that it's human nature to focus on goals in one area of life, or maybe two areas of life if you're lucky, to the detriment of the other areas of your life. For this reason, there's a tool that I use on my clients called the Goal Wheel that is specifically designed to shed light on how you might be preventing yourself from living the fullest life possible. In a nutshell, the Goal Wheel is a circle drawn on a piece of paper that's been divided into eight quadrants. The eight quadrants are family and friends, romance, fun and recreation, health and fitness, finances, personal growth and spirituality, career, and physical environment. Basically, you give yourself a score between one and 10 for each of these areas of your life, and that allows you to see where you're excelling and putting your attention, but it also shows you the areas of your life that you're currently neglecting. The areas of life that we neglect are often the areas that we need to work on the most, and that's exactly why I started this podcast, to share insights from teachers who are experts in one or more of these areas of the goal wheel. Each interview is meant to inspire you to take action in one of those areas so that you can live a more fulfilled and balanced life. To get your hands on a free copy of the Goal Wheel PDF so that you can use it to create meaningful goals and take steps to achieve them, head over to powerplantbody.com forward slash free dash tools. You'll find a bunch of other free tools and resources there as well. My interview today is with Will Brooks. Now, I've been following Will on Instagram for a number of years now, and he's a lean, mean, green lifting machine and an inspiration to anyone who wants to build their best body on a vegan diet. Will also fuels his high-performance martial arts training on a vegan diet, and in our interview, he shares how his diet has benefited both his training and his recovery. Will shares the story of how he became vegan, the benefits he started seeing in his life from switching his diet, and the major shift in perspective he had when he became more conscious of his food decisions. Will has come back from serious injury to absolutely dominate and master his physical fitness. And now he's teaching others how to do the same, both through his social media and coaching his clients. When it comes to the goal wheel, Will has the health and fitness quadrant covered and shares a ton of knowledge for you to take away and start implementing today. One last thing, I just switched over to a new podcast recording software and I'm still working out the kinks. As a result, I chose the wrong mic input for myself and the audio of my voice is really distant and pretty poor quality. The good news is Will is the guy that you want to be listening to in this interview anyway. That being said, my apologies for the poor quality of audio from my voice and I'll be sure that I need to remember to uh, you know, select the right mic. I appreciate your understanding and I hope that it won't get in the way of what Will's message is and what he has to share in our conversation. So without any further delay, I'm grateful to bring you my conversation with Will Brooks. Well, uh, Will, I appreciate you having, or I appreciate you being on the podcast, and I'm super excited to dive into uh, what you have to share because I've been following you for some time. I mean, you're a shredded beast on Instagram, and you're posting crazy workouts that uh, I want to try, but I'm actually kind of scared to try. To be honest with you. Um, <laughs> I know but yeah, but. <laughs> But why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about who you are, um, what you what you do on Instagram and YouTube, and then, uh, yeah, we can dive into your story. Yeah, absolutely. So my name's Will Brooks. Um, I run the page Will Brooks Official on Instagram, where I basically do coaching for vegans and non-vegans alike, anybody who wants to get involved, anybody who wants to transition, and people who are already doing it, who want to build muscle, burn fat, stuff like that. Um, I've been on the platform now for, if I had to guess, about three years, because I've been vegan just a little longer than three years. I've probably been on the platform about two years then. But... Um, Basically how I got there, that's a, that's a long story, and I'm going to try to tighten it up for you because 
if you let me tell you, so. <laughs> I don't know the details will be here all day, but um, so it goes back to 2014 when I met my then girlfriend, now wife, Marky. She was completely vegan. She was full ethical vegan. And she's the one who introduced me to the whole idea. Now I'd been exposed to it once or twice in the gym before, which comes full, full circle because this guy that I had known in the gym back when I was, you know, kind of a, kind of a meathead, I would say, I think I still am a little bit of vegan meathead now, but <laughs> this guy was a giant and he was vegan and I kind of just shrugged it off. Like he was lying. Like there's no way, yeah. you know, you're getting that big on peanuts and spinach. You know, that's what I thought back then. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I met Marky, that's my wife, and she kind of exposed me to the, to the ethical side, but not all at once. She didn't, you know, force feed that stuff to me. It was, you know, little by little. And um, I would always consider myself an animal lover, even back then. But, you know, when we started dating, she hit me with, oh, you're a pet lover. And I was like, mm -hmm. wow, uh, you know, I guess I can't argue that. Like, yeah, I contribute to all this other stuff. So I think that was the first click, you know? Um, but I had never, I, I had tried a couple times. I went plant-based a few times and it just wasn't working for me because I don't know, I wasn't committed or for whatever reason. And I ended up injuring my spine in the gym. I was doing really heavy um, barbell lunges. And I'm going to be completely honest, I wasn't using perfect form. I was not controlling the movement on the eccentric movement. So every time my, my knee would hit, you know, the weight would bounce on my back. And then I get up and I do it again. The weight would bounce on my back. And I, after about three months of that, I worked my way up to 275. On uh, oh, smokes. Yeah, I w my legs were getting really, really strong. But with that poor form and that you know that poor mechanics, my uh, I eventually blew out the disc between C6 and C7. And it was so bad. Anybody who out there listening knows anything about herniations or who or who have had one, mine was herniated by 22 millimeters, and it had pinched my spine so badly that I couldn't use my left arm. Uh, I could feel. I I lost a lot of sensation in my left arm. Um, lots of tinglys and needles. I felt in my fingertips, but I couldn't even hold on to a water bottle. And it was at that point, you know, we realized, like, this isn't going to fix itself. We need surgery. So I had the surgery. And up until that point, I had always suffered from really severe golfer's elbow and tennis elbow, and even some tendonitis in my shoulders. And I got to the point where I just kind of accepted it because it wasn't going away when I was eating meat. Um, so had my spine injury, I recovered. It took three months. I had my dog in here, by the way. If, <laughs> if we get any kind of interruptions, this is, this is the trouble. Oh, nice. <laughs> What's your dog's name? Her name's Bella. Bella, Bella the troublemaker. Yes. But um, so I, I needed to sit still for like three months during the recovery process. So that meant no working out, like no cardio. I wow. couldn't train anything, not even my legs. You know, obviously, because they, they fused my spine and that requires a lot of just stillness. So as you can imagine, um, when your workouts aren't happening, the diet kind of goes out the window. And I mm. reverted back to a point where it looked like I had never touched a weight in my life. So, uh, yeah, I, I had lost, I would say, 99% of my muscle mass. I lost a lot of weight. I, I gained a belly, you know, and it was tough. And when the doctor cleared me to work out again, I was really excited because all my tendonitis had gone away during that three month period. So I was like, you know, maybe this was a blessing in disguise. This is what I needed to finally get relief from my tendonitis. And at this point, I'm still eating meat. I'm, I wasn't me, uh, vegan at all. And yeah. um, started working out and within, I would say a couple weeks, tendonitis came right back. And now at this point, I'm thinking like, I'm gonna have to give up jujitsu. I'm gonna have to give up weightlifting. I'm gonna have to give up something because now on top of this severe tendonitis, I have, a stiff neck and I've got neck pain because I've got metal in there and it's fused and it's just not a comfortable situation. It's not conducive to putting forth the effort you need to see progress. So it was right around then, you know, Marky was still working on me, showing me the ethical side of veganism. And then she switched over to showing me some of the, uh, you know, plant-based athletes. And, you know, at this point, you know, when I, when I did switch to veganism, uh, 
I'll be completely honest, it was more for selfish reasons. I still, you know, a lot of the times when I watched the animal ethical side, I would kind of grimace and look away. You know, if I watched an animal get, I I don't like gore. I don't like, I've never have. I don't like seeing people get hurt. I don't like seeing animals get hurt. But, you know, the way I dealt with it was I would just look away. And I wouldn't, you know, if I don't see it, I don't have to deal with it. So, you know, it's, it's crazy because I, when I initially went vegan, it was for my joints and the health and I wanted to be in shape and fit. And I knew that it was like helping the animals, but I hadn't made that full connection yet. And then, so I went vegan and within two weeks, all of my joint pain was gone, including the pain in my neck for my surgery. It was, it was game changing. And, you know, I was really, really happy about that. And, you know, all the while I'm still kind of getting my micro dosing of, you know, the animal ethics. And at this point I'm starting to realize like, Hey, I need to pay attention to what she's showing me. I need to force myself to watch it. So, uh, I stopped looking away. I started ingesting the, I guess the horrors of animal agriculture. And I realized, you know, okay, I'm vegan now. I went for the, the health benefits, but now this is turning into something that's motivating me to stay vegan. And it's motivating me to, um, it, it's just, it, it's like another layer. It, it turned it, it turned from a top layer, mm-hmm. kind of like, like the cherry on top of the cake down to the foundation. You know what I mean? So once I really understood the importance and I really started to learn empathy, which is something I was never taught and I never really had it as a kid or growing up as an adult. So she taught me a lot about empathy. And once I started to strike that empathetic nerve, uh, the animals turned into my foundation. And that's what motivates me now Mm -hmm. to, and that's actually when I decided to make my Instagram back in the day. Cause I, you know, I I came back, I bounced back from a, a bad injury. I built myself back better than I ever was as a meat eater. And I'm doing it older and with injuries. And at that point, you know, I had made the connection to the animals and I said, you know what? I just, I got to put something together. I got to, I got to get online and show people what can be done. Because at that point, you know, the animals were tugging on my heartstrings a little bit, you know? So mm-hmm. that's basically what got me to where I am right now. Um, and I, I got to say, it's been a, it's been a ride and I wouldn't change any of it. You know, any, especially even the, uh, the spine surgery, because it all, it all plays its part. It's all a piece of the puzzle. And, uh, you know, where I'm at now is pretty cool. I'm happy and I get to make a difference for the animals and the people and the environment. And that's really what it's all about. So. That's awesome. You, you, see, you mentioned the environment there too. I, I think like that story of how you get into it through health is similar to a lot of people. A lot of people, um, maybe not in the exact same position as you, um, more people than ever being switched on to a plant-based diet and they have high cholesterol or, uh, you know, they have uh, uh, possible potential uh, for heart disease. So they switch over to a plant-based diet from their doctor. And then, like you say, once you start going layers deeper, you start to see all these other things unfold and, and it starts to check a few other boxes. And, uh, and, and the way you said, like for you, it just completely switched the other way. Like the health obviously is still there for you. You're, you know, you're a testament to, the, to what you can do on a vegan diet. Yeah, but it's also um, the foundation, as you put it, is um, you know the compassion and the environmental uh, you know implications of your choices. Absolutely, I love that, man. So, so you were um, you were weightlifting before, but you lost all your muscle. But you you've also you're prolific in uh, in your BJJ too, right? You're a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, like the combative arts is a big part of your fitness as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was another factor. You know, I, because my joints had healed, I was able to push harder in the gym, but also in jujitsu. And I was able to, uh, my stamina increase. That was one of the big things I noticed mm-hmm. with jujitsu. You know, I had more strength, more muscle mass, less fat in the gym, but you know, that doesn't always, you know, in jujitsu, you want to focus on technique rather than muscling through everything which was actually a hard lesson for me to learn because I grew up as a wrestler and in wrestling, you're, 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 they train you more like a bulldog. You know, you want to be strong and powerful (laughs) through everything. And and in jujitsu, you want to use technique more, a little more finesse. And, uh, I had noticed that, yeah, my stamina went way up and I was able to focus more on my technique and my brother, um, 
it's a funny story, man. I, I really came, I, I turned myself around a lot and I don't show a lot of that on Instagram, but I used to be really, really, really big into uh, like partying and drinking. And that's like a whole nother chapter that, you know, I may talk about one day, but my brother and I both joined jujitsu at the same time. And mm. I didn't stick with it because I wanted to, I wanted to party and drink and chase girls and, and all that stuff. And he stuck with mm. it. And now he's a black belt, you know? So oh, wow. yeah, that's a, that's a reminder to me that like, you know, your, your life choices, every time I see him, you know, I'm so proud of him, but it's a reminder mm. to, you know, your, the choices you make in life eventually catch up with you, whether that's, you know, eating mm. plants, or not eating plants or partying or not partying in one way or another, it's either going to pay off or it's going to creep up and bite you in the ass. So, um, yeah, used to be a big, big time partier. I'm making up for it now. You know, I, I'm a purple belt. I'm a second degree purple belt under Helsin Gracie in, uh, our I mean, business. That's no joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, dude, he's the real deal. He's, he's actually a small guy. He came to our school once for a seminar when I was a white belt. Oh yeah. And, uh, one of the Brown belts at the time said, Hey, listen, he likes to pick, the white belts for his, uh, I guess his dummies, you know, he'll pull you out and show the move on you. And he says his English is, eh, you know, just go yeah. with the flow. Don't resist him because he'll, he'll really beat you up if you do that. And, uh, I made it successfully through the whole seminar without making him mad, without getting beat up. And then I think like at the end he wanted to have some fun. So he shows this move where, you end up getting like held upside down by your growing essentially. It's a really painful move. Oh, man. <laughs> and the guy's like, Sounds awful. The, the guy's like five, 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 six, like, you know, 140 pounds. I don't think he's full vegan, but I, I think a lot of the Gracie family is plant based. I think that they're probably mm. majority plant based. And it's cool even seeing in a little frame like that, you know, he was able to pick my 190 pound body up, you know, like it was nothing. So, That's crazy. That's and crazy. he's old. He's old, you know, he's, I'd have to guess, I don't know his exact age, maybe upper 60s, but yeah, he's, he's older. Wow. Yeah. You mentioned at the start of your, what, when you were, just before your injury, just before you got your neck injury, you, there was a guy at your gym, he was a big, tall dude, big, strong guy, he was vegan. And yeah. uh, at that time in your life, you, there was like a, uh, a disconnect for you. you. You couldn't like you, you couldn't chalk it up to the, you know, as you said, like the, the you know the peanuts and lentils or whatever. Um, that mindset that you had back then, if if you could speak to that version of yourself, if there was any insights or um, you know knowledge that you pass on or different ways of thinking about things, how would you like what, what little nuggets of uh, wisdom would you give that version of yourself who you know would be interested in pursuing this? diet, this, this way of fitness, this way of uh, lifestyle, uh, but just needs a few questions answered or a few um, insights brought to attention. I, I would say first and foremost, um, you're being closed minded and you need to open your mind because when you kind of step out of your comfort zone, that's when you're going to learn the majority of that mental wealth. That's where, where, that's where it all lies outside your comfort zone. Um, I was very closed minded back then to the idea. I mean, the guy was standing right in front of me and gi he was a giant mm -hmm. dude, you know, I mean, big all the way around. <laughs> and I, I would like to tell myself that, you know, animal protein isn't what your body needs. Your body just needs protein. It doesn't matter if it's animal protein or plant protein, you know, um, plant protein comes it, you know, basically plant protein comes with so many more things, a lot more micronutrients, because obviously if you're eating it from, you know, whole foods, like just lentils, for example, you know, you're getting a lot more with that protein source, um, protein slash carb source than you are with just say chicken breast, you know, especially the whole, uh, you know, I was really big on estrogen awareness back then. I didn't want right. to spike my estrogen. I, I was so scared of soy. I, I think I like, I read one, like, four paragraph article in a muscle and fitness magazine. It talked about how soy milk can help, you know, or it'll prevent your gains because of the soy in it. And I didn't fact check. I didn't, I didn't look into that. I just believed it, you know, and I would tell myself, trust, but verify, you know, definitely do your homework, but know that plant protein is just as good, if not better than animal protein, because it has so much more stuff that comes with it. Um, 
I find that funny too because a lot of people want to bring up deficiencies when it comes to veganism. But what about the guy that eats broccoli, rice, and chicken all day? Like, imagine all the things he's not yeah. doing. You know, like he's definitely yeah. deficient in something. So, you know, it's you just need to open your eyes and be available to new ideas. And uh, you know, as a young, impressionable guy in my twenties. I, my, my main sources of, uh, I guess, inspiration were guys that were on the Mr. Olympia stage, you know, who are right. taking tons of synthetic, you know, supplements, steroids, mm -hmm. and they, yeah. you know, you see them in the magazines back then, it was, you know, chicken, broccoli, rice all day, every day. And that was my inspiration. <clears throat> I think now, you know, I'm 37 now, I'm a little bit older, Back when I was in my 20s, uh, you know, social media wasn't super huge back then. I think we might have had uh, MySpace. Thank God no one can find mine anymore. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't have access. <laughs> right. I didn't have access to all these guys that are, you know, who are doing it um, now on plants. And the funny thing is, like, these guys who are on the Mr. Olympia stage, I never wanted that. I never wanted to be a Mr. Olympia. But for some reason, that was my inspiration. You know, I never wanted right. to be, it wasn't like, you know, being that big wasn't something I wanted. I thought it looked cool, but why was, why was that my source of inspiration if that was never really my goal? You know, I, I like right. the guys now who are, who are practical and sustainable and a bit like, you know, you got a great physique and you're doing it on plants. Um, you're not, you know, some freak, you're not like freaky huge, but you know what, like, Guys like you are the guys who, you know, a lot of people are going to be looking up to because not everybody wants to be a Mr. Olympia. And even for the younger guys who don't really know what they want, like myself included, they see a Mr. Olympia. Back when I was growing up, that's all I had to look up to. But now there's guys like you and me who are showing like, hey, you can have a great physique. You don't have to be 300 pounds and 4% and body fat. You can have a great physique, yeah. you're strong and athletic and do it on plants. So yeah. I think uh, that's that's another reason why – I want to put myself out there. I'm assuming that's probably why you put yourself out there is just to be an example to that younger generation growing up. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you don't see a, a, a vegan Mr. Olympia. Well, you got to remember this is still, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is still kind of new. This whole, this whole, you know, Game Changers, the movie really widened people's awareness to this. But, you know, before Marky, I had no idea that it was really a thing. I mean, the guy in the yeah. gym back, back in the day told me he was vegan. I just thought he was lying. I shrugged it off. You know, I didn't give the guy a chance. <laughs> yeah. So now the awareness is growing. I mean, okay, yeah, there might not be a vegan Mr. Olympia now, but 10 years, I wouldn't be surprised if we got some guys up there who only eat plants. It's just a matter of time, you know, so... Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, that, that guy back in the gym, he he didn't mean anything to me then, but now it's it's such a huge lesson. And I, I take that with me when people don't believe that I'm vegan. And I'm not I looking back, I still think that guy back then was way bigger than me, you know? I'm I'm more of like a a lean body, like I've lean muscle mass. I'm not hulking. This guy was he was a hulk, you know, and just full circle, you know, pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, when you're talking about um, coming up in your 20s and looking to Mr. Olympia, I remember the, you know, feeling a very similar way when I was younger. Uh, you know, we're about the same age, and, and I remember the, I don't know if you ever had them, but the Flex magazines. Have you ever had yeah. the Flex magazine? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember, this, you know, like you're, you're young, you don't really understand what's real, what's not real, what's attainable, what's not attainable. I remember seeing these guys. And again, seeing what they were eating, same thing, you know, like they would have meal plans sometimes in, in uh, Flex Magazine, it's you know, chicken and broccoli, chicken and broccoli, like you're saying. But um, what, I was, what it reminded me of is, uh, I'll have to find the study because I'm probably going to get it at least somewhat wrong, but the study that I remember is they took, there's a group of heterosexual men and a group of heterosexual women. And they asked the men, uh, they had a scale of, uh, of, of different figures, right? So they had like a really skinny guy on one side and then like Ronnie Coleman on the other side, and everybody in between is a spectrum of different disease. And they asked the men who they thought was the most attractive, and they asked the women who they thought was the most attractive. And the men picked basically like Ronnie Coleman or the guy just before, you know, like the 300 pound, 2% body fat guy. And the women 
chose like the guy who looked like a slightly built soccer player, you know, like a wasn't wasn't a Hulk by any stretch, just like aesthetically look, you know, like aesthetic and had a little bit of muscle, but looked athletic. And uh, I, I think that it's really easy for guys, especially younger guys, like when you were in your twenties when I was in my twenties, really easy to like have this tunnel vision on what we think we want. Um, but if we were able to pull back just a little bit, we could kind of get a more holistic approach to this whole thing. Look at longevity, look at uh, overall health. For sure. So, so with your uh, with your Instagram, you're uh, well, you have a YouTube channel too. That you mentioned that you're, you're you've been uploading to, that you'd like to upload more to uh, in the future. Um, a big part of what I get from you and your uh, and, and your social media is like this. Like it seems very functional the type of fitness that you're going after. You're not the you, I mean, you do bicep curls for sure. But uh, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that you're throwing into your workouts is very uh, it's very functional and very, very like I imagine that plays a lot into your uh, BJJ Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. What, what if you were to talk about the type of training that you do and the type of training that you do with your clients? What um, how would you describe it? What does that look like? Well, it, I guess with my clients, it depends on where they're at. I I tend to take on a lot of people who are in their beginning stages. And when I'm dealing with a beginner, I keep it pretty simple and straightforward. I'm not throwing in too, too much functional fitness type stuff. Um, you know, I, I like to keep it, how do I say this? I, I don't want to say I keep it simple, but I just, I don't want to overcomplicate it, you know, because I don't want to, you know, give a new person to this lifestyle, a plate filled with these crazy options. They don't know what any of it is. I like to keep it simple and say, here, this is where we're going to start. We're going to build from here. Now, as far as like the functional fitness goes, um, personally, I like, I, you know, instead of running, because I, I did have my meniscus in my right knee removed in 2009. Yeah, I tore, I had a bucket handle tear. So instead of like a straight tear through your meniscus, it's a bucket handle. It looks like a U. And it creates a flat. Oh, okay. So the cartilage gets stuck up in the knee joint. They just shaved it out and then cut around the edges. So I lost like 90%. So That's awesome. I, yeah, I've been forced kind of out of that traditional training mindset. So okay. now for my cardio, I will do like I have a climber. I've, I've talked about my climber a couple times on my uh, Instagram, a lot in my stories. But every morning when I wake up <clears throat> before I have breakfast, it's not because I like fasted cardio or anything. I just, I like to use that to wake up. I'm not a morning person and I don't want to just jam down a bunch of coffee to force myself awake. I like to wake up either with like a cold shower. Yeah. Or some cardio. And a lot of times, you know, I live in Ohio right now. It's, uh, I think it's like 17 degrees outside. I'm not, I could go running, but it's just not really practical. You know, I want to remove as many hurdles as possible for me and for my clients. So I like to suggest this climber I use. It's the Maxi Climber XL 2000. And essentially all it is, it's basically like an elliptical machine, but your legs are going up and down and then you grab the handles and your hands go up and down. It's a full body workout. Um, and yeah, since you're no joke. Yeah, oh yeah, when I first got it, I, I think I got three minutes in and I had to take a break because I just wasn't used to that kind of cardio. So that specific machine really uh, works well for my jujitsu. Um, there's one thing I've noticed, even like back in high school, when I was, I would run, I would, I was, uh, I would either do cross country or football in the beginning of the year. And then I, I'd always do wrestling. Wrestling was my go-to. And both sports, we did a lot of running and being in phenomenal running shape, it didn't really translate to jujitsu. You know, I could run, I was always a really good long distance runner and I could be in great long distance running shape, but it just wouldn't translate to jujitsu. I would still burn out just as fast in a match or even in wrestling in a match with being a good runner. So I've noticed that the climber a little bit more functional uh, because I can work out and I can go to jujitsu and it, and it kind of translates. Uh, another thing that I really like to do are, uh, or hammer and tire workouts. So I was able to find yeah. Uh, yeah, 500 pound tire from an old, uh, an old paintball field. The guy had a contract with some of the semi truck businesses in the area and he gets these gigantic tires. So I ended up picking up a 500 pound tractor tire 
Um, he uses them for obstacles in the paintball course, but he gave me one for free because they're hard to find. You, they're hard they're to find. Supposed to be a, and they're supposed to be immovable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's the point. Like they're they're, they're, they're like using the obstacles because they're not supposed to move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, I have that. What I like to do is I have a 20-pound sledgehammer. Um, so a little, a little trick for the people out there who want to take part in this. When you go buy a hammer and it has the weight on the head, that's just the weight of the head. That's not doesn't include the weight of the handle. So um, my hammer says it's 16 pounds, but with the handle, it's closer to 20. So I'll say I have a 20 pound hammer. People are like, I can't find a 20 pound hammer anywhere. Well, it's 16 pounds and then you add the, the weight of the handle. So, but I like to just alternate. Um, I'll do 300 reps, sets of 50, one, alternate, one, two, two, you know, and that, just doing that, make sure you're coming up on your toes and then crunching your stomach and bringing, bringing it down with your abs, bringing it up with your, uh, your back muscles. You're getting a crazy, crazy good full body workout. Um, that's another functional kind of exercise I like to do that translates really well to jujitsu. And I know I, I always talk about translating to jujitsu, but what people don't realize is, you know, we've people who are just weightlifting strong, it's, it's a different kind of strength. It's, it's not that tensile strength that you need to feel strong while you're grappling or fighting with someone. Um, we get a lot of guys that come into the gym and they are gigantic dudes, maybe big power lifters or they're big bodybuilders. And when you get down to grappling with them, you know, certain parts of their body are weak, like their like their uh, abductors or maybe their hip muscles. And it's really easy to manipulate their body because once you turn someone's hips, you basically have full control. And you can control someone's head and their hips, you're right. gonna do really, really well. And uh, you want that tensile strength that you get from functional fitness. Um, that's gonna translate really well. Even, even if you don't train, if you get into a situation where you need to defend yourself, you're gonna want some of that tensile strength. Because if you're just benching all the time, um, it's not, it's not going to be as helpful as you think it would be. It's, it's pretty crazy. So as far as I go, I, I like to do the functional stuff for my clients. It depends on your level. If I have someone who's been doing it for a while, I'll introduce them to more functional stuff. Um, because another thing I've, I've noticed is that, and I try to be careful of, is if someone doesn't have a lot of experience, uh, I don't want them to get involved in something that's going to cause injury. Uh, a lot of beginners right. don't know a lot of form, and that's the problem with you know, online training, like you can shoot videos for people and you can send YouTube how to videos. And, but if you're not there to correct them, cause I have a couple people I train in person, it's much easier. You know, you get to watch them in the gym and correct their form. You know, if you send someone a workout, that's a little more excessive or extreme than they're used to. And then they hurt themselves. You're not, you don't, you really don't want to, you really don't want to be, you know, causing people harm like that. So I, I tend to be careful depending on your experience level. To long answer to your short question. <laughs> no, that's perfect, man. Um, you, you actually brought up a, an interesting point there, which you know the, the online training. So you do both you do in person training, you do online training, and um, you know the vegan community or like uh, people who are um, uh, into vegan fitness and have uh, like Instagrams like yours. That's growing, but it's still quite small compared to the you know the massive amounts of fitness influencers out there and people who. Um, you know, teach people how to move their body and achieve their fitness goals. So I imagine that you get people reaching out to you quite often. So uh, for people listening or watching who don't know Will, um, he's shredded pretty much year round, and, and like you're a big dude and, and you're a strong dude. So I imagine that you have people reaching out on, our, on a regular basis asking, you know, how how they can achieve a similar physique or how they can achieve a certain fitness level. Um, reaching out for online training. So, what are some of the what are some of the regular questions that you get from people? And when it is time to switch into like a like an online coaching um, relationship with a person like that, what does that look like for for you and them? Um, how do you help them through that whole transformation process? <clears throat> That's a really good question. So. Uh, I get a lot of people asking me, how can I look like you? How long, or how long is it going to take me to look like you? And they, and they want to do it in three or six months. And, um, I, I like to remind people, you know, I've been working out since I've been 14 years old and I'm 37 now. So, um, this isn't something that I did in three or six months. You know, there's, I know there, yeah, there's people out there who are way bigger, way more ripped than me. And, 
probably did a lot of my progress on their own path in a lot shorter of an amount of time than I did. But I don't, I don't candy coat it for people. You know, I don't sell people dreams because that's just going to lead to a failed mindset. It's going to be, you know, it's just, you want to promote people and you want to put them on the right path and you want to make them feel good, but you also want to tell them the truth. So I I remind people, Hey, listen, I've been doing this since I've been 14. I'm 37. Now it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in three months. It's not going to happen in six months. Like you're going to see results and that's what you want, but you got to remember that you got to take it in small steps. And I love one of my favorite quotes, and I can't tell you who said it right now. I'd have to look it up, but um, is small steps climb mountains. So you think about climbing Mount oh, yeah. Everest, you know, it's not something that you're going to do in one night, but you're doing it in small steps. And if you stay on it and you're consistent, you stay the course, it will happen. But it just, you can't rush it. Anytime you rush it, you know, It's not sustainable. You're playing around with the possibility of injuries a lot more than if you were taking your time. So I just, I like to remind people, go at your own pace. Don't compare, you know, my chapter 20 to your chapter two. I, I'm, I, I like to tell them like, I represent the average guy, the average guy who works hard and is consistent. I'm, I'm nothing special. I, work hard and I'm consistent. And this is like, it's therapy for me. You know, I, I train and lift six days a week. I take one day off and I vary up my, my exercises. So I'm not beating up one part of my body too much, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a professional bodybuilder. I don't represent the top 1%. I represent the average person. If you stay consistent over a long period of time, if you don't stray from your diet and your and your meals if you stay in the gym and just keep working. So I like to be honest, you know, and sometimes that makes them feel a little down, but then I remind them, hey, I'm just an average guy who doesn't stop. And then they're kind of like, oh, okay, like get it in your mind. It's going to be a long distance run. It's not a sprint. And if you can stay, uh, if you can stay in the race, you're going to get to the finish line. Not that fitness, is, there's a finish line here. This is more of a lifestyle than kind of like a, a race type thing, but you like to give them that, that end prize. You know what I mean? And, and you know, that's something else that, uh, that makes me think about is, uh, you know, your chapter 20, you know, you're on chapter 20 of your story. They're on chapter two, at least as, as far as fitness is concerned, I'm doing this a lot longer, but that doesn't mean, I, I think often people think about, you know, when they reach out to someone like you, and they, they look to you the way, the way that you look and aesthetic and that's what they want for themselves. <clears throat> when they think about that, achieving that over several years, um, that can be daunting as you said, but I think the mindset that some people, sometimes people get caught up in is, it's not like a, I'll work, 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 work for several years and it'll all be the same and then one day I'll wake up and I'll look at will. Um, there's a whole bunch of steps along the way where you're gonna, there's gonna be work for six months, man, I've got, you know, I've got a bicep now or, you know, I, I can like squat a certain amount of weight or whatever that, whatever these uh, milestones are along the way to that journey until they get to their own chapter 20. Um, there's a whole like unfolding of uh, these, you know, these milestones that are so worth the journey. Yeah. I, and that's another thing too, is, you know, you have to be prepared for hiccups and hurdles. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of people will run into a situation that really isn't, um, it really isn't something that they wanted to deal with and they'll just give up. You know, I, if you get injured, that doesn't mean you stop working out. That means you kind of formulate a new workout around your injury. So for me, you know, I don't have meniscus in my right knee, so I don't run, but I do my climber. Um, I have a few spines, so I don't squat with weight on my neck, but I'll do a leg press. You know what I mean? You're going to come across hiccups. You're going to come across things that are going to feel like setbacks and failures, but that doesn't mean you stop. That just means you work around it. Everybody goes through it. The people that get to where they want to go are the people that sidestep and continue forward. So I, that's another, it's another point I like to touch on with them. Yeah. yeah anytime you sign up for a goal, you're simultaneously signing up for tiny failures along the way. It's not <laughs> tiny hard to tiny uh, hiccups. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no doubt. Well, I think we were, we were all faced with that, you know, in 2020, uh, most people's gyms shut down and then what do you, you know, for me, I, I was forced into, uh, figuring this out, this whole body weight thing out. Um, 
which had always been a goal of mine anyways, but I was like, you know, everybody's got their thing that uh, it's just always, uh, it's, it's the thing that they know they should do and they want to do, but they just never do it. And bodyweight exercise was my, my thing and I was forced into it. That's so cool. a lot of people were in 2020, you either, either change, either, uh, like for you, you can't, you, you're not able to squat, but you can do a leg press, you know, you do the leg press. You know, I wasn't able to work out in the gym, but I could do some push-ups. So, you know, I did some push-ups. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, cool, brother. Well, um, so the uh, so the nutrition side of things, we, uh, a lot of people ask about that journey that you did, that they'll go on if they you know if they reach out to you about the fitness side of things. For nutrition, what are some of the nutrition questions that you get often? Um, you know, from people that reach out to you on Instagram or, or other social media platforms. Well, we all know we get asked about protein. Uh, how much do I need? Uh, you know. I, I used to be the guy that, like I said, looked up to Mr. Olympia as thinking I had to get two grams of protein to get, you know, to look like them. And uh, I'm, I'm still kind of shocked to see how many people believe that to be true or semi-true. You know, as, as active as I am, I, I get about 0.7 to 0.8 grams of protein. You know, sometimes I go a little bit over, but I'm, if I go over, it's on accident. It's not, it's not because yeah. I'm trying to get extra, you know, as a vegan, I'm not, it's not hard to get the protein you need. Like once you know the foods that have all the protein, um, it's really not hard to hit your numbers. And, uh, you know, another misconception is people think protein is like, uh, it's almost like some kind of like magic serum, almost like steroids. Like the more I eat, the bigger I'm going to get. Well, actually it's only repairing the muscle damage that you've caused. So you can heal that muscle, but you're only gonna you're only gonna see as many results as much destruction you cause to that muscle. You know, so just because you do an hour workout and you cram down 200 grams of protein a day, that doesn't mean you're gonna get bigger than if you did 300 grams of. You know, it's not a magic serum. It's protein isn't some magic drug. It's it's a macronutrient, and it it just repairs the muscle fibers that you've already broke down. So. I'm constantly trying to unravel that one. Um, mainly just protein is the one I get. People sometimes want to know my macro split. And right. I, I do like to, I, I try to remind them as long as you're getting enough calories for your goals and then you're on point with your protein, I tend to be a little more easygoing on where my fat, my carbs lie. I, I do prefer um, a lower fat diet. You know, I, I, Per meal, I'm probably, I don't ever go over 10 grams of fat. Per meal, I'm probably around 30 grams of protein and maybe like 40 to 50 grams of carbs. That, I feel good on that. Some people swear by uh, keto or vegan keto. I'm not a big keto fan, obviously, but like vegan keto, some people swear by it. Um, you know what, if it works for you, then okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're not, we're all the same, but we're not all the same. Like we're all pretty similar. We're all built the same. We all have the same chemicals, the same, you know, genetic makeup to a point, but you know, there's just so much more that goes into it, especially like convenience and, and the food that's around you that's available. Maybe, you know, the diet that I'm doing is just going to be too difficult for you to do because the availability of food isn't there. So then you're going to do vegan keto. Well, if that's what it takes to get you to a point where you're happy with your body, then okay, do that. That's fine. Just make sure you're getting, you know, the macros, the micros, make sure your protein's on point, make sure your calories in the right range, because that's another thing. People switch to veganism or plant-based and it's really easy to fall short in the calories because a lot of the food is light on calories and you can fill up and feel stuffed and you might be at half the calories you would on a meat-based uh, meal because that food is calorie dense. So it's walking a fine line because on one side, you know, you're not going to get enough and you're going to feel like crap. Or on the other side, if you know how to use that to your advantage, you can get really lean and you can maintain that leanness all years, which is what, you know, guys like us do. You know, I stay, I try to stay right around 10%. Sometimes I, I drift up to around 12, but um, it's sustainable. I don't have to kill myself, you know, my sticking point is right yeah. at percent. You know, if I want to go below 10, if I want to get to like, because sometimes I'll hit nine without, you know, just doing what I'm doing right now. But if I want to get to eight or seven, it takes extra work and it's draining. And um, if you've, you know, I know you've ran cuts before. 
that your that loss of energy is there. It's you know it's lack of calories. Oh, it's awful. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I try to help people avoid. So I would say those are probably the main ones that people ask me. Yeah, I like that, man. I, I like your approach. It's um, it sounds easy. It sounds accessible to people, right? It's not like oh, you have to eat this many grams of protein, this many grams of yeah carbohydrate. You have to fit this, but it's a uh, you're you're um, you're taking a more uh, uh, holistic approach to the whole thing, and especially not to chuck two grams of protein per pound. <laughs> you know, it's down everybody's throat. That sounds uh, pretty yeah. horrible. Yeah, absolutely. I, I try to keep it simple to a point, but I don't want to oversimplify it. You know, when people come to me for a meal plan, I'm the one figuring out all your calories, your fats, your carbs, your proteins. Um, and, you know, that's actually how I do it for myself. I don't count my calories and macros every single day. What I do, excuse me, is I make a meal plan for myself and then I follow that every day. So I count everything once. And then I just follow that. And that way it eliminates all that counting and weighing. Like I make my meals. Well, I have to be careful with this because Marky makes my meals. And if I don't get <laughs> right it, I'm going to world of hurt. Yeah. So she, she makes my meals most of the time. But um, yeah, you do the meal plan. You generate everything once. You know what you need. And then you just follow that to a T. So, I mean, I know there's people out there who count every day. I just, if I was doing that, I wouldn't stick to it. So it's all about making it simple enough and sustainable enough that you could follow it every day without having to, um, I guess, stress about other things that are going on in your life. Because we all got other things going on. You want your health and fitness to be sustainable and simple enough that you can mix it in with your normal life. So that's what I try to do. Dude, I love it. Um, I want to be respectful of your time because I know we're coming up to an hour here, but... Uh and it's been super, super insightful. I mean, I've been, like I said, at the start, I've been following you for a long time. And uh, I love the stuff that you promote. So if people wanted to reach out to you, get, get a meal plan or get some coaching or just learn more about who you are and what you do, where's the best place to find you? So you can find me on Instagram at Wilbrooks Official. Some people prefer YouTube. Uh, Will Brooks official. Uh, the YouTube channel is, it's kind of taken a, a back seat to everything right now, but I do plan on getting back to that. I still answer all my messages that I get on there. Uh, but mainly Instagram, or you can email me at veganironape at yahoo.com. Um, I answer those frequently as well, but probably the best place would be Instagram. Awesome. Brother. I'll make sure that all of those are in the show notes and uh, I will uh, add them to the the show page as well. So thanks again, Will. It's been an absolute pleasure. Appreciate your insights and uh, look forward to seeing more of your content on Instagram and YouTube. Back at you, brother. Thanks again for checking out this episode of the Power Plant Body Podcast. If you enjoyed it, I'd be grateful if you left it a rating and review in iTunes. When you leave a rating and review, it really helps because it lets iTunes know and they'll be more likely to promote it to others who could also benefit from hearing these conversations. And also feel free to share this episode with people who could also benefit from Will's insights into health and fitness and achieving your best life on a vegan diet. You can find Will on Instagram. His handle is at Will Brooks official. That's W-I-L-L-B-R-O-O-K-S-O-F-F-I-C-I-A-L. And in his bio, Will shares a link to his YouTube channel, favorite vegan supplements, and a ton of other resources. You can also send him a message if you're interested in Will helping you achieve your fitness goals with in-person or online coaching. Don't forget to head over to powerplantbody.com forward slash free dash tools to get your hands on a free copy of the Goal Wheel PDF, along with tons of other free tools. I'm regularly adding new resources to that page to help you create the best version of yourself so you'll definitely want to bookmark it. You can find me on Instagram at the vegan trainer. That's at T H E V E G A N T R A I N E R. And feel free to send me a DM if you have any questions at all or suggestions for future episodes. Thanks again for checking out this episode and spending some time with me and Will today. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day.